All right, please go and grab your Bibles. Open up the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter number 4. Exodus chapter number 4, we'll read a few verses. If you remain standing as we read the Bible. Exodus chapter number 4. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Read a few verses, then we'll pray. And then we'll uh, jump into the sermon this morning. Exodus chapter number 4. Beginning in verse number 1. Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Let us pray. Dear Father, I pray that you'll challenge us. Help us, Father, to learn. Help us to grow. Help us to be not satisfied with where we're at in our Christian walk, in our Christian life. Help us to be challenged to go forward for you with boldness, not because of what we are, but because of who you are and the promises that you have given us. Father, I pray that you'll allow me to put myself aside and allow me, Father, to trust in you. Allow me, Father, to be used of you and your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll speak through me. Help me, Father, not just to fill a time, but to be a help and a challenge. And help us all, Father, to change our lives because of the truth that was presented. Help us to be an honor and glory to you and lift up your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You may be seated. So we see here in the book of Exodus, chapter number 4, we see uh, God is talking with Moses, even back in uh, chapter number 3. Uh, chapter number 3, if you want to look there, this is where uh, uh, the, the, the account of the burning bush takes place. And chapter number 4 is an extension of that. Moses is still in the presence of the burning bush, and therefore in the presence of the Lord. Uh, long story short, we see in the book of, uh, in the chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, we see Moses, uh, he, he works for his father-in-law Jethro. Uh, for he, he married uh, Jethro, one of Jethro's daughters, and he works for him now as a shepherd. He takes care of Jethro's sheep, he takes care of, their, uh, of the flocks, and, and he therefore leads them. He guides them around to different places, and he takes care of the sheep to the best of his ability, and he tries to make sure he takes care of them and protects them, and the Bible says in Exodus chapter number three that he led them to the backside of the wilderness, and he led them there, and the Bible says that Moses noticed that there was a burning bush, and that he also noticed that it was not being consumed. And so he said to those that are around him, he says, look, I'm going to go check this thing out. I don't know what's going on here, but I want to go see that because that looks interesting to me. There's a bush that's burning, but I can see it's not being consumed. It's not getting burnt up. It's just on fire and it's Nothing's happened. The flames are there, but it's not eating away at it. The flames are there, but it's not decaying away. And so he said, I'm going to go take a look at it. And so he did. And the Bible says that when Moses drew near, that the Lord spoke to him. He said, take off thy shoes. Because where on thou standest is holy ground. And so the Lord begins speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. And Moses begins listening to what God had to tell him. And God is going to explain to Moses what he wants him to do. He says, Moses, I, I have a job that I need you to do. I have something that I want to use you for, Moses. And it was to free, it was to lead God's people, the Israelites, out of bondage from Egypt and into the promised land. Understand the significance of what God is putting, is presenting to Moses. He's asking Moses, he's telling Moses, this is what I want you to do, Moses. The thing that your, that your family, that your people, that your nation has been waiting for and been looking for for over 400 years. Hundreds of years have gone by since God has promised to, da- uh, since God has promised to Abraham that he'll make of thee a great and mighty nation. And Many years have gone by since God has promised to Abraham the land of Canaan, the the land that floweth in milk and honey. Those promises were still true, but the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, were still waiting for God to fulfill that promise. And God told Moses, he said, Moses, you're the one. You're the one that I've chosen to lead my people. I've chosen you to go back to the place that you were once at. I've chosen you to go back and to lead them out of bondage, 
to lead them out of their slavery. I, the Bible says, the, the Bible says I, I have heard their call. I have heard their groanings. The Bible, it's, it's, uh, the Lord talks to Moses and says, it's time for them, and I'm ready, Moses. And I've chosen you. You see, God has the great and mighty deed that he is going to use Moses as his earthly means to complete it. Moses was going to be used to show God's power, God's might, God's love, amazing things that some of them haven't been seen again. The Red Sea, that's something that only happened once in history to that magnitude, and it was that, and that was it. It was done on a smaller scale with the River Jordan, but it wasn't a sea. The Red Sea. An entire sea opened up and showed forth the dry ground. And the children of Israel had a way of escape from the, from the Egyptians. God was going to use Moses in such a great and mighty way. And God could see what he was going to do. And he was telling Moses, it's time for you to trust me. Moses was going to be used to lead God's people out of the Egyptian bondage. Out of Egypt and to the promised land. Once again, this is the promise that had been waiting hundreds of years to be fulfilled. God was going to use Moses to be his man to lead the people of Israel. But despite God wanting to use Moses, despite God choosing Moses and telling Moses, this is what I want you to do, Moses. This is what I've chosen you to do. Moses began questioning and bringing up reasons about how and why he could not be used of the Lord in a great and mighty way. You see, God wants to use you. He wants to use everyone in a great and mighty way. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God has desired to use all of us in a way that we cannot comprehend, in a way that we don't understand. God doesn't have to have someone to be a pastor. God doesn't have to have someone to be a great leader to use them in a great and mighty way. God, God used a little Israelite maiden to help a great captain of the Syrian army be freed from his leprosy that he was going to die from and you never even know her name God doesn't need you to be great God is the one that's great he wants to use us he's just waiting for the vessel that's willing to be used no if ands or buts God desires to use everyone in a way beyond your imagination so what does God want you to do and are you being like Moses? And have you allowed things and reasons to hinder your usefulness for God? Have you, like Moses, began questioning and began drawing lines in the sand of saying, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. Well, have you thought about this? What does God want you to do that you're not going to do or that you do not want to do? Let's look at chapter number 3 and verse number 11. In the first few verses, we see Moses see the burning bush, and then he goes to the burning bush, and then God tells Moses, this is what I want you to do, Moses. This is what I have chosen you for. And then in verse number 11 of chapter number 3, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, sorry, that's chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 3, there we go. And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. The first thing Moses asks is, who am I? Oh, who am I? I? I'm nothing so great. I'm nothing so amazing. And what does God say? Verse number 12. And he said, certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee, and that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. God said, uh, Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. It's not about who you are, Moses. It's about who I am. You see, Moses asked the question, who am I? Which, if we're all honest, that's the question we should all ask. Who am I? God says, I don't care who you are. Who you are is not the important thing. The important thing is that God says, I will be with you. That should have answered all things for Moses and all things for us because God has made us a promise. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. 
Joshua 1.5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee Amen. nor forsake thee. God has made you and I a promise just like he made to Moses. God made that promise to us. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you think of you. God made the promise that I will be with you. And that in of itself should be the end of the story that God says, I'll be with you so we can go forth boldly because God has made us a promise. So what is holding you back for the service of the Lord? You see, Moses said, who am I? And God says, I'll be with you. That should have been it. That should have been all. Moses should have said, okay, well, you're going to be with me. Then answer all the questions. There is no other question because no matter what I go through, I know God's going to be right beside me. But Moses didn't stop there, just like us. We have the promise, just the same promise that Moses has, we have. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And just like Moses, we'll find something else to question. We'll find some other reason why we can't be used of God or why God should find somebody else to do the job that he has chosen us to do. What is your name? What if they, don't, uh, what if they want to know who sent me? That's the next thing Moses brought up. And Moses said in verse number 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Lord God, the, sorry, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? He says, What, what if they ask me who your name is? What if they ask me who sent me? Yeah. And God answered, verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say, thou, thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. What is God saying? God's saying the eternal one. The one that has no beginning and no end, that one, the one has sent me. God has sent you. The one that has all power hath sent you and has sent me. And then Moses then says, as we saw in chapter number 4, verse number 1. He says, what if they don't believe me? That's what he says, verse number, chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. So not only has Moses said, oh, I can't do it, and God says, I'll be with thee. Not only has Moses said, oh, but who am I going to say sent me? And God says, I am, the one that has all power, the one that just states his being, and that's all you need. That's what God is saying. Just, just God being is all we need. It's all that's sufficient for us, for you and for me. And then Moses goes on to say, but what if they don't believe me? They're not going to believe me. They're going to say I'm some cuckoo crackpot and I, I'm out of my gourd, whatever. He says, they're not going to believe me. So God then has to perform two miracles to show Moses, okay, Moses, I already said I'm going to be with you. I already told you who I am, but I'll go even further and I'll show you things that no man can do. And as we read in, this, in the verse, in chapters, uh, verses 1 through 4, God, the Bible says God, told, God asked Moses a question. What's in thine hand? And Moses said a rod, the shepherd's rod. And God told him, okay, cast it on the ground. And Moses cast it on the ground. And the Bible says it became alive. A serpent, a snake, just starts, starts moving around. And the Bible says that Moses fled from before it. He had the right reaction. He started running. I don't know about you, but if I was holding a stick and I throw it and I, I drop it on the ground and it starts slithering around, I would, I would be out of there as well. I wouldn't say, oh, wow, look at that science experiment. I would say, I'll observe from afar. But Moses had done that. And then God told Moses, which is even more baffling, he says, grab it by the tail. If you know anything about snakes, you don't grab it by the tail. They, they have the ability to come around and latch on to you. But credit to Moses, either he didn't know anything about snakes or he just truly trusted the Lord, and he 
grabbed it by the tail. And the Bible says that it became a rod again. And in the next few verses, verse, uh, verse number five, that they may believe that the Lord God of their father is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. He says, take your hand, put it into your bosom. Put it into your clothes. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Leprosy is a disease that eats away at all of the nerve endings and it kills them. Your body literally begins to rot as you're alive. Any parts of your body that has leprosy, it begins to rot. It begins falling apart. And that's why it says it was white as snow because it literally was at that point when it says white as snow, leprosy doesn't just turn it white. That's when it has become extremely rotten and it's about to fall apart, about to fall off. In fact, many people that have leprosy, when they would go to sleep, they'd have leprosy camps. And a lot of times they would go to sleep and they'd wake up and they didn't have a finger anymore because the rat came and ate it or their nose got eaten right off their face while they were sleeping. And that's how bad leprosy is. There was no cure. It was a death sentence. Once you got leprosy, you went and lived in the leprosy colony, and that was it. And so Moses puts his hand in his bosom. He takes his hand out, and it's leprosy. For one thing, that would be very scary because that's a death sentence. There's nothing he can do about that. But not only is it leprous, leprous but it's white as snow. It's, it's, been, it's leprosy that's been there for a long time. And I'm sure Moses thought, I haven't had leprosy that long. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again, and he plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. God's trying to show Moses, he says, Moses, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. Moses, I'm the one that's sending you. I am, has sent you. Moses... I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. I'll show you what I can do. I, I don't worry about what they say. I'll take care of that. Right. After all that, Moses still has something else to say. In verse number 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. What was he saying? I, I, I can't speak well. Many people have speculated that maybe Moses had some sort of a stutter or something like that. Whatever it is, Moses says, look, I can't talk. Oh, I can't stand before Pharaoh. I couldn't do that. I, I'm slow of speech. I, I'm slow of tongue. Oh, I could not do such a thing. And God tells Moses, okay, Moses, then Aaron can be your spokesman. The Bible even says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. God was saying, okay, Moses. This is getting a little old now. Yeah. And he says, okay, Moses, if that's big of a deal to you, Aaron can be your spokesman. So the question is, what have you allowed to become a hindrance in the service of God? What, what has become a thing that, that you have become like Moses and you begin asking questions or you begin trying to find reasons? You try to begin reasoning yourself of, oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't do that. What if they do this? What if they do that? What it all should have been answered when God says, I will be with thee. That answers all the questions. But God in his goodness didn't just say, Moses, I'll be with thee. Moses, I'll be with thee. God in his goodness and gracious told Moses, he says, okay, let me answer that. Okay, let me answer that. Okay, let me answer that and God does the same thing with us he is so patient and long suffering so the question is Amen. what have you like Moses have allowed to become a hindrance in your service of God let me ask you this where are you on Sunday night the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 forsake not the assembling of yourselves together where are you when the church doors are open oh I'll be there on Sunday morning what about Sunday night Sunday night's a different church service. It's a church service. The doors are open. It's an assembly, and God has commanded you, forsake not the assembling of yourselves Amen. together. Where are you on Sunday night? Why are you not in Sunday school? 
Sunday school is a time for believers to come together and have a smaller group to learn and to have a more teaching time of the Bible, to have more of an understanding of the Bible and things God wants us to understand and grow. And so we can, as Christians, grow in our ability to serve God and our ability to be used of God. So where are you during the Sunday school time? Is your sleep so important that Sunday school just isn't that big of a deal? Why are you not helping and serving? As the saying goes, it's time to take off the bib and put on the apron. It's time that you understand church is not just about becoming fed all the time, about coming to sit, soak, and sour, and to come and to take in, and to take in, and to take in. It's the mature Christian that says, it's time for me to start helping. It's time for me to start serving. It's time for me to see how I can help. Why are you not in choir? Why aren't you in the nursery? How is your giving? God has things that he has commanded us to do, that he wants us to do. So how's it going? How have you become like Moses and you become asking questions and you begin giving reasons and you begin drawing lines to the sand of, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't teach a Sunday school class. I don't have the vocal ability to teach a Sunday school class. I don't have the mental capacity to teach a Sunday school class. And God says, I don't need your mental capacity. I need your obedience. I need your willingness. That's all God needs. God doesn't need you. He needs your heart. He doesn't need your abilities. He needs your willingness. God's waiting for Moses to get to the place where he says, okay, whatever you want, I will do. Where are you on Thursday night? Why aren't you dressed for church? You don't dress for church to impress everyone around you. You dress for church to, impress, to, to be an honor to the king. To show honor to the Lord, you dress in the best way that you can. It's not about you. It's not about those around you. It's about giving honor to the one that you're giving honor to. When you dress up for certain occasions, you're showing that this is a special occasion. So when you don't dress up for church, you're telling God, this is not a special occasion. This is no big deal. And I don't know about you, but Jesus Christ dying for you so you could be free. I think that's a big deal. But that's just me. What is it that you have drawn the line and that you have told God, I just, oh, I can't do that. I am unable to do that. Why aren't your kids in kids' choir? You just have to come drop them off. Where are you to help bear the burden of taking care of the church property? And the church building. Why, why aren't you willing to help bear the load of taking care of what God has given us? Why aren't you willing to take up and step up and being, as it said before, take off the bib and put on the apron of helping those around you, of helping take care of the blessings that God has given us? Hey, how about this? Where are you on Saturday morning when it's time to go out and tell the lost and dying world about Jesus Christ? Where are you on Saturday morning? Do the souls of men mean nothing to you? That's good, preacher. Come on. Because your soul meant something to somebody else. Amen. So it's only right, just in that aspect, not, not even looking at the aspect of Jesus Christ, it's only right just for the fact that someone had compassion on you, that you would have compassion on somebody else. But then we go into the fact that Jesus Christ, the one that lived the perfect life, gave his soul, gave his life for you, went into extreme agony so you could have freedom in Christ. Amen. And you choose to use that liberty, as it says in the New Testament, as a cloak of maliciousness. I can, I'm free to do what I want. I don't have to do this. What are you holding on to? What have you allowed to become the reason that you don't serve God the way he wants you to? What have you allowed to hinder your growth in the Lord? To hinder your usefulness for the Lord. Amen. You see, we like Moses are often too concerned about finding reasons about why or how we cannot serve God. Like God doesn't know our downfalls and our hindrances and our weaknesses. We act like God is un unknowing of these things. 
God knew the questions and the things Moses was going to say even before he talked to Moses. God knew Moses was slow of speech or slow of tongue, at least in his own mind. God knew that. And so we are too preoccupied, just like Moses, of trying to find reasons why we cannot serve God. How about we take time to think about how I can serve God, about how God has chosen me to be used of him, how God has made it possible for me to spread his gospel, for me to be used of him in a great and mighty way. Psalm 103 verse 14 says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. When you tell God, oh, I can't do that, oh, I can't do that, God says, look, I know you better than you know yourself. Don't try and give me all these reasons. Don't try and give me all these excuses. I know who you are. He says, I'm the one that made you. I know you're made of dust. And that's why God, all the way at the very beginning with Moses, says, I will be with thee. God says, no matter what, no matter how deep the waters may get, no matter how hot the fire may burn, God says, I'm always right beside you. God says, I know who you are. I know your downfalls. I know your weaknesses. I know your inabilities, and I have chosen you. God makes no mistakes. So when God says, I want you, he didn't miss He didn't get his files backwards. He he didn't say, oh, whoops, sorry, wrong person. No, 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 he knows who you are. He knows your frame. He knows your specific weaknesses. And he says, I have chosen you. Just like he chose Moses. So instead of finding reasons about why we cannot be used of God, let's find ways that we can be used of God. Find ways that I can be better used of the Lord. Find ways that I can be more effectual and fervent and efficient for the service of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, we see here in Exodus chapter number 4 and verse number 2, God asked Moses a question. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? Does God need to ask you what's in your hand? Does God need to, as he did with Moses, What's in your hand? And then verse number three, he says, cast it on the ground. Just imagine what Moses is thinking. This is his rod, his trusty shepherd's rod. One of his closest companions. He probably never leaves his house without his rod, especially when he's going to work with the sheep. The shepherd's rod is of great importance. It's just a trusty companion as a walking stick. It's used as a tool. It can be used as a weapon. It can be used for so many things to the shepherd. And God tells him, cast it on the ground. Moses, what's in your hand? It's just my rod. Cast it on the ground, Moses. What does God need to tell you? It's time to cast it on the ground. It's time to let go of it. You see, the reality of our situation is not that we're holding on to the rod. You see, the reality of the situation is that your rod is really holding on to you. You see, those things that you think you have and you think they're a help to you and there's something that you're working on and you're holding on to, God says, look, I can see it for what it truly is. It's something that has begun to hold on to you. It's something that has begun to latch on to you. Moses was commanded to let go of something that was, seemed to be a no big deal. If anything, it was a constant help. It was a constant aid to him. But could it be that is why God told him to cast it down? Because Moses was more willing to trust on his shepherd's rod than he was willing to trust on the word of the Lord. God does not want you trusting in anything but him. No matter how small or insignificant that thing may be, God says, I'm a jealous God. I want all of your trust. I have done everything. I have made you. I gave you my son. I give you my love. I want all of your trust. I want you to go to me for everything. So Anchor Baptist Church, what have we allowed us to hold on to? What have we allowed to latch on to us and hold us back from the service of the great I am? Of the one that says, I want you to go forward. And what have we allowed to latch on to us that we hold on to for security? 
Oh, this just makes me feel secure. God says, I would rather you hold on to me to feel security. You see, how we, like Moses, strive to find how I cannot serve God. What about this? Oh, what about this? Oh, what about that? And so God eventually just has to tell us, hey, what's in your hand? Throw it on the ground. Learn to trust me. Not what you can see, not what you can feel. You see, what could it be that has allowed you to hinder or stop your service of the king? Is it your strength? A lot of people, oh, I'm strong. I can do this. I can do this. God says, I don't care what you can do. Amen. Has your strength hindered you in your service of the Lord? How about your knowledge? Oh, I know. I, I understand. Proverbs chapter 3 very explicitly tells us, lean not into thine own understanding. You see, because God understands the more you understand, the less God will be able to teach and help you learn. Because I understand. I already know. A child in school who thinks they understand what you're trying to teach them will not listen until they butt their head against the wall 15 times and they keep you on getting the problem wrong. And they say, I don't understand. Oh, I thought you did understand. That's why you weren't listening before, because you understood. You see, understanding is a dangerous thing because we think we understand, and we could never be wrong. I am me. I'm the person I trust most in this whole world. Is that your hindrance? Oh, is it an individual? Someone that, oh, I, I, I just need to be around them. I, I need their help. God says, I am that for you. Amen. I am the one that you're to hold on to. Anchor Baptist Church, where is our fire? Where is our zeal to press forward for the cause of Christ? Amen. Or has you just sunk back into a reality and a normality and just, this is who I am, this is what I do. And God says, no, I want you to let go of what's holding on to you and press forward for me. Amen. Where is your desire to press for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? You see, I would rather die a David Brainerd, young man, 28, I believe he was 28, 29 years old when he died, but he died doing what he knew the Lord wanted him to do. He died in the service of telling the Indians, the Native Americans, who Jesus Christ was. And he died, a young man. But he knew he was doing what the Lord wanted him to. I would rather die young than live a long, full life of trusting in myself. I would rather die young knowing I did what God wanted me to do than living a long life of Happiness and contentment and trusting in what I've done yeah. and saying, oh, I don't know about that, God. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, what about this? Have you thought about this, God? Oh, what about this? Life is, get this, life is not more precious than pleasing my God. My life on this earth is not more precious than knowing that I have pleased my God. You see, that's what David Brainerd would say. That's what Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church, would say. My life's not more precious than knowing that I pleased my God. Stephen died the martyr's death, stoned to death. First one to die of the church after Jesus Christ. And all it was is because he preached the name of Christ. You see, he was not afraid to lose his life, to please his God. He says, this is what you want? Okay. This is what you desire? No problem. Could God be telling us to cast aside what makes us feel comfortable, just like the trusty walking stick of a shepherd? God desired not to devastate Moses. He does not desire to devastate or crush no, God wanted to show Moses who he needed to trust in. What has become your rod? Like Moses, it's a trusty companion. I go everywhere with it. It helps me walk. It's a tool. It's a weapon. I can protect. It does me good. 
but that's become very important to you. What is it? Could it be your children? Be very careful what you begin using your children as an excuse yeah. or a reason for. Children are not an excuse to not serve the Lord. They are an avenue of greater service to the Lord. I remember growing up, me and all my siblings, every Saturday, we're out visiting the bus route with my parents. Every Sunday morning, guess where we were? All of us on the bus route. There were five of us. That's not an easy thing, okay? And we all loved each other. Just kidding. No, we were children. There was a time... For my mom, when she was, before I was born, she was pregnant, sprained both of her ankles, and still had three other kids to deal with, and guess what? She was still on the bus. In fact, she sprained one of the ankles because she was trying to get out of the bus when she had one sprained ankle, and she slipped and fell. But that's what was important to her. You see, serving the Lord was of the utmost. It wasn't being comfortable. It wasn't finding a way out of service of God. It wasn't finding a way, whether it was uh, uh, sprained ankles, whether it was children, there was nothing that was going to stop between her and her service of God. There was nothing that was going to hinder the service of my father to his God because God was most important. Psalm 127 says, Lo, children are inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty hunter, sorry, a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with enemies in the gate. You see, God did not bless you with children to have you become a hindrance in the service of him, but to open up new avenues of greater service for God. You see, the wise man says, I know God has given me these so I can be a help to them, but also so they can be a help to me in the service of God. What has become the thing that's holding on to you? Be very careful for what you use, a reason and an excuse not to serve your loving and caring God. What has the Holy Spirit pricked and started convicting you about? You know what's in your life. We all have it. We all have things, just like Moses. One of the most amazing men to ever live, Moses. And at his initial calling, he's fighting like nobody else against what God wants him to do. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, what if they do this? Oh, they're not going to believe me. Oh, I just can't. I, 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 I can't do it. But you see what God was able to do? You see, Moses began to get the picture when he understood, it's not me. It's not my rod. You see, and God might not even be looking to take something away from you. He might just be looking for you to learn to trust in him. Because what did he tell Moses to do? He says, pick it up again. Not all the time God says to give something up is he actually looking for you to take it away from from, from you. Sometimes he is. Sometimes he knows you'll be better off without it. But sometimes he's just trying to teach you something, just like he was with Moses. So you know what it is. You know what has been holding you back and continues to hold you back in your service of God. Our church has a great opportunity and a great privilege to serve our Lord. So where are you in the service of God? Has church just become a place where you come because you know you're supposed to. Of a truth. Seems like you're splitting hairs, but there's a great difference between the man that does right because he knows it's right and the man that does right because he wants to please the Lord. Amen. If you're just doing right because you know it's right, you're just telling God, I just don't want to get in trouble. But if you do right because you want to please your God, you say, you've done so much for me. Let me do something for you. Let me be used of you. So what is it that you allow to 
have a stronghold in your heart that you've built up and said, no, I can't do that. Oh, no, no, no. I can't do that. God says, okay. God wants us out of our comfort zone so we can learn to trust and depend on him. You see, many times the will of the Lord puts us outside of our comfort zone. Maybe not super out far of it, just outside of it, because he wants us, because when we're not comfortable, we're looking for something to latch on to. We're looking for something to trust in because I'm not able to trust in what I usually do because I'm outside of what I'm comfortable. And God says, that's where I want you so you can come to me. So what have you begun holding on to? Do you aim to please God? Because if you do, then when God says to do something, you'll do it without a second thought, without a moment's notice. It'll just be okay. And, and in many times, God wouldn't even need to ask you to do something because you're aiming to please him. You're aiming to do what he wants you to do. You're learning to think with the mind of God. So why are you, why is our church beginning to sink into an area of normality? Have we begun to hold on to something that's hindering our service for God? You say, I just can't go any forward. This is, what I, this is what makes me comfortable. This is what I trust in. And God says, take what's in your hand and cast it on the ground. Let me show you what I can do. Just think of Abraham, told by God, kill your son. Oh, the one that I promised you, the one that you've been waiting for many years for, and the one that you've had for many years, take that one and sacrifice him to me. Knife in the air, ready to plunge down. And God says, I see now, Abraham, I know you trust me. What about Noah? Building an ark. Very possibly, the Bible says it earlier in the book of Genesis that it did not rain in those days. So either that meant that it just did not rain during the time of Garden of Eden, or it very possibly could mean that it did not rain until the days of Noah. But either way, whether it had rained for Noah or not, I guarantee it did not rain enough to fill the whole world. But Noah, out of complete trust of God, says, I'll cast it on the ground. My understanding of what I know can happen, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to throw that on the ground because you have told me this is going to happen. Right. Something that I've never seen and will probably never see again to this magnitude, I'm going to cast it on the ground, and I'm going to trust you. You see, that's what God is looking for. Amen. Sometimes God may ask you to do things that seem crazy, wonky, out of this world. But God says, I want to show you what I can do. So what have you begun to hold on to? And you've begun to grasp with all of your might because it's so important to you. It's such a scary thing to let go. And God says, cast it on the ground. Let me show you what I can do. Oh, that's what you can do with it? Let me show you what I can do with someone that's willing to trust me. God wants to show you what he's able to do. Do you trust him? Where have you drawn the line with God? Where do you begin to question God and say, this is as far as I can go. This is as far as I can move. I, I just don't know if I can trust any further than this. God says, cast it on the ground. Take those limitations. Take those places that you've set up and throw them on the ground and say, God, wherever you want, however far you want, whatever it may be, it doesn't have to make sense. I'll trust and I'll follow. I, I guarantee you it doesn't make sense to Moses to go stand before one of the most powerful men of the day and to say, let my people go. A shepherd. <laughs> That's who he was, a shepherd. The shepherd's coming to tell the king, let my people go. Amen. God tells Moses, put your staff, put the rod in the river. Okay. He puts it in the river. And God says, I'll do the rest. You know, I wonder how much 
would have never happened if Moses had not just done the simple things that didn't make any sense. But you see, Moses learned when he was fighting with God, I just do whatever God tells me to do. Cast it on the ground. Why? Why should I cast it on the ground? Just cast it on the ground. Just trust me. And let me, let, I want to show you what I can do. What is God wanting to use you for? What great and mighty things has God in store for you? But he's just waiting for you to trust him. He's just waiting for you to say, you know what? I'm going to trust you. The leap of faith. God's just waiting for us to say, I'm going to trust you. God wants to use you just like he did Moses. But God will only use you to the place that you deem him. I wonder who God would have used if Moses stood firm and says, no, I'm I'm not going to cast on the ground. I wonder if he would have used Aaron. Maybe her. Maybe he would have went straight to Joshua. I don't know. Because Moses was willing to say, you know what, it doesn't make sense to me. (sighs) But I'll cast it on the ground. And I'll do the crazy thing that you want me to do. So where are you, church family? Where is your desire to see the fire of God once again? Where is your desire to do what your loving God has asked of you to do? Where is your fire to see Columbus set on fire for God? Where is your desire to see God move in your church and in your town? Or is it just that? I'm just waiting for the time. I read about it this morning with Jesus talking about the last days. He said there are going to be some that are going to be for it all the way. But there will be some that are just there to bide their time. I'm just here waiting for God to return. That's not what God's looking for. Whatever it is, your strength, your knowledge something you're holding on to, an individual, God says, throw it on the ground and just trust me. How have we, like Moses, latched on to something and just say, I can't move forward? Are you ready to see the greatness of God flow through the aisles of the Anchor Baptist Church? Are you ready to see God use you in a way that doesn't even make sense, that's not even comprehensible? You know, I guarantee you, when Moses, for those 40 years, was watching Jethro's sheep, I don't think he thought about, man, I'm going to do some pretty crazy things. I'm going to see all these plagues come down. I'm going to see the Red Sea part. I'm going to see water flow forth from a rock. No, I don't think he could have even imagined those things. I mean, could you? If it wasn't in the Bible, would you even think of the possibility of those things happening? But we have the Bible. We know what God has done. So what's your excuse? To say, oh, I just can't trust God. Cast it on the ground. And let's see what God can do. Let's pray, dear Father.